Good morning and thank you for being here. How, how exciting to actually be face to face in person uh, together uh, today. We've, we're very thrilled to be here. My name's Vicky Durston, Director of Policy, Advocacy and Support Services at Breast Cancer Network Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Jagara people with the Turrbal people. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge our past patron of BCNA, Quinton Bryce. Thank you for joining us here today. And also our past chair of BCNA's board, Mark O'Donnell. Thanks, Mark, for joining us. Our current BCNA board member, Professor Bruce Mann, was joining us today, but he may be a little bit late. And BCNA CEO, Kirsten Pilati, staff, CRs, and all of you here today. I've been fortunate to be part of BCNA since January 2020. And prior to this, my career as a registered nurse specialising in cancer care for over 20 years has contributed to my interest and passion to improve the lives of all those diagnosed with a spe special interest in the specific needs of those with metastatic breast cancer. The passion to want to do more and do better for those affected by breast cancer is part of why I imagine you are all here with us today. BCNA is a leading organisation for breast cancer. In, it's all about making an impact, making a difference. This was aptly the title of our first national conference in 1998, the first conference of women from across the country personally affected by breast cancer. As BCNA launched that year, right from the beginning, we made it clear we wanted to be seen and heard. And our visual display of the sea of pink silhouettes out front of the grounds of the then Parliament House was how we made this statement. And over the years, we innovated our approach to bring the real statistics to life, to create the ocean of people in ponchos on the grounds of the MCG, making a stand for those affected by breast cancer. These significant moments in our history have continued to thrust into the public arena the reality of what we are all here in this room know all too well. To bring the statistics to life of those that we dedicate our careers as healthcare professionals to, to signify the real human impact and the prevalence of this disease. We all want every person affected by breast cancer to live their best life. But the reality is, despite improvements to treatment and care and improved survival outcomes, those diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer continue to be confronted by challenges that see them reporting higher supportive care needs and yet poorer access to the supportive care services they require, further compounded by often feeling excluded and invisible in amongst the broader sea of pink. Despite our key awareness activation events, helping to convey the incidence and overall survival rates of breast cancer and incorporate st statistics such as male breast cancer at a national event, what we have been unable to achieve thus far is to identify the prevalence and therefore the significance of those with metastatic breast cancer. Those 2,500 white lady silhouettes planted in 1998 signified the then 2,568 people expected to die from the disease. Today, it is expected 3,000 people will lose their life. We don't want to only know who dies, we want to know who is living. BCNA has long been calling for improvements to the collection and reporting of metastatic data, as well as advocating for improved services to address the currently unmet supportive care needs of this population. People with metastatic breast cancer are living longer than ever before thanks to new medications and therapies that aim to slow the cancer's progression and control symptoms. However, healthcare goals and outcomes extend beyond prolonging life and must also incorporate ways to define and live a quality of life with metastatic disease. We know through our work to date that appropriate care and support are essential for anyone with a cancer diagnosis. For people with metastatic breast cancer, the lifelong nature of treatment, complex care, and the anxiety that accompanies the uncertain prognosis and disease trajectory can be physically, financially, and emotionally challenging.
But what we have known for some time now is that we don't actually know across the country how many people are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer or living with it. Although breast cancer is renowned for galvanising patients, advocates, researchers, policy makers and healthcare providers, resulting in care that is often the envy of other cancers, within the breast cancer community, this group often report feeling overlooked and even invisible. This is not a new issue. BCNA and other breast cancer organisations around the world have been advocating for increased and strengthened visibility of metastatic breast cancer for the best part of 10 years, as exemplified by this quote by Dr Fatima Cordosa from the ABC Global Alliance. It's also in the report. In 2022, despite significant progress across nearly all facets of cancer care in Australia, we are still no closer to shining a light on this population through consistent national reporting for metastatic disease. With Australia's first national cancer plan currently in development, there is an opportunity to strengthen the voice of not only those with metastatic breast cancer, but all those living with metastatic disease. So I stand here on this most poignant of days on International Metastatic Breast Cancer Awareness Day and at the AIBC conference to draw a line in the sand, to stand bold for all of what BCNA exists for and represents, to be a voice on behalf of our network, to say we are making metastatic breast cancer count. Because of the lack of national data, they remain invisible. To ensure metastatic cancer is prioritised, we must see significant steps towards the national data collection of this particular population. These statistics, these lives, these people whom you care for and strive to provide the best quality treatment and care outcomes to will no longer be hidden in plain sight. With the support and learnings of our international community and champions within the sector coming together, we can make a difference. Today is a key milestone in this direction. We are launching here today our inaugural issues paper, Making Metastatic Breast Cancer Count. No longer hidden in plain sight, and we again bring the relevant statistics to the forefront. Using modelling available to us, we estimated that there are, were at least 10,553 people living with metastatic disease, breast cancer, in Australia in 2020. This is a conservative estimate and the figure is likely to be significantly higher. By 2025, it is estimated that this figure will increase to about 12,840 people living with metastatic breast cancer. Without this exact figure, we cannot advocate, plan or invest to ensure our health systems are meeting the needs of this group. This issues paper couldn't have been a reality without the significant contribution of many in particular, Dr. Andrea Smith. I'm delighted to now have Andrea join us to talk more about the issues and its impact. Thanks, Vicky. It's a real privilege to be here today. I'm Andrea Smith. I'm a research fellow at the Daffodil Centre in Sydney, where my work focuses on reducing current inequities in access to supportive care for Australians with advanced or metastatic cancer, specifically um, starting with metastatic breast cancer. I'm also someone who is living with a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis, having been di diagnosed stage four de novo in 2016. In the past two years, I have been working closely with BCNA as a consumer rep I chair BCNA's Metastatic Breast Cancer Lived Experience Group. I sit on their strategic advisory group. And along with Kirsten Pilati, we sit on the board of the ABC Global Alliance, representing consumer organizations working in metastatic breast cancer. So perhaps not surprisingly, I have a particular interest in co-designed research. I strongly believe that the biggest gains are going to be made if researchers partner with research end users and consumers to identify the questions that are important to people living with cancer. This partnership with BCNA's policy and advocacy team, the Daffodil Centre, the University of Sydney, and most importantly, BCNA's consumer reps, has led to the clarification of what we believe is an urgent issue in cancer care in general, 
and metastatic breast cancer care specifically. Over the past few months, my colleagues, Dr. Sally Lord and Professor Diane O'Connell and Jody Leidecker and I have been working with BCNA to understand what we know about the incidence and prevalence of metastatic breast cancer in Australia. This information is critical to BCNA's advocacy efforts. As Vicky indicated, the short answer is surprisingly little. We simply don't know how many people are living with metastatic breast cancer. We don't know how many people are diagnosed every year. In developing this paper, we identified two issues. The first is that despite the considerable successes and achievements in breast cancer, BCNA knows from its network that people with metastatic breast cancer often report feeling overlooked, even invisible. This is not just an Australian problem, it's a problem internationally. The reports you can see from the advocacy agencies around the world clearly capture how people with metastatic breast cancer feel. The titles of these reports speak volumes. The Invisible Woman, Secondary, Not Second Rate, I'm Still Here, The Unsurvivors. When I was diagnosed, my first thoughts were, thank God it's breast cancer. It's well-funded, well-resourced, leading the way not just in treatments, but in supportive care. However, the reality was different. I found out that not all breast cancers are equal. Metastatic breast cancer, the most serious type of breast cancer, and the only one you'll die from, actually seem to have the least amount of support. And I'm not talking about treatment. I never for one moment doubted that I was getting the very best treatment I needed for my cancer. Me being here six years later is testament to that. What I'm talking about is supportive care. I felt excluded or overlooked by a number of the services that I believed would be there for me. This included breast cancer-specific services, such as the workshops and information sessions at my hospital, and more general cancer survivorship programs and peer-to-peer -peer programs. Many of these actively excluded me because of my metastatic status or because I had not finished treatment. So what is making us invisible? The reasons for this are complex. The first is the celebration and dominance of the breast cancer survivor narrative in society generally, but even within our breast cancer consumer advocacy, healthcare, and research communities. While this celebration of improved breast cancer survival rightly acknowledges the incredible progress that has been made in breast cancer, it effectively shuts out the voices of those who will not survive, that is, those living with metastatic breast cancer. It could be said that we are hidden in plain sight. A recent campaign that caused upset and confusion within the metastatic breast cancer communities was the final 9% campaign that talked about saving the final 9% of people who weren't making it to five years. But we know 20 to 30% of people with breast cancer eventually die from breast cancer. So to us, the final 9% doesn't make sense. The way we talk about breast cancer survival focus almost predominantly on survival at five years. But the story, it doesn't finish at five years. There's something happening after five years, which means we end up with more than 3,000 people dying from breast cancer every year, many of whom were alive at five years. The second reason for our lack of visibility is that surviving long-term with metastatic breast cancer is a relatively new phenomenon driven by the improvements in treatment. Our current breast cancer care systems and breast cancer models of care while successful in delivering clinical care and treatment to people with metastatic breast cancer, are perhaps not yet as well-placed to deliver the much-needed holistic supportive care or metastatic survivorship care that is critical to maintaining quality of life for these patients. We believe that Australia's cancer care continuum needs to evolve to explicitly include those people who are receiving treatment not to cure or to palliate, but to prolong life and to support these individuals to live as well as possible in the extra years given to them by these treatments. In the US, the National Cancer Institute is referring to this phase as metastatic survivorship. In the UK, they refer to this as the treatable but not curable population, a phrase I really like for its directness and its positive aspect. So the second issue that we identified is that we don't know how many people are living with metastatic breast cancer. 
This is because Australia's population-based cancer registries are not required to collect data on stage at diagnosis or recurrence. When our cancer registries were established in the 1970s, their primary function was to report the type of cancer, the number of people diagnosed with cancer, and how many people died from cancer. That is, cancer cases and cancer mortality. However, 50 years later, cancer treatment and care have progressed considerably. It is now important not just to know who has cancer and who has died from cancer, but who has early curable cancer and who has metastatic or advanced cancer. These are two distinctly different populations with distinctly different supportive care needs. So in addition to incidence and mortality data, we urgently need our cancer registries to collect and report how extensive the cancer is at diagnosis, i.e. the stage, and when cancer progresses or returns, i.e. recurrence. Critically, the stage and recurrence data will also allow us to determine prevalence, so we know how many people are living with metastatic breast cancer in Australia. This gap in cancer registry data has been recognized in Australia for many years. It was highlighted in Cancer Australia's National Cancer Data Strategy Report in 2008. Since the 2008 report, some progress has been made in understanding how our cancer registries might report stage at diagnosis and recurrence. As part of the STAR project, Cancer Australia, the State and Territory Cancer Registries, and of the Australasian Association of Cancer Registries, developed nationally standardized methodologies for collecting stage at diagnosis. This registry de derived cancer stage at diagnosis uses data sources that are routinely accessible to all cancer registries. To date, registry-derived stage has been collected for only one year, 2011, and for the top five incident cancers, so female breast, colorectal, lung, prostate, and melanoma. Following on from this, in 2019, Cancer Australia and the Cancer Registries developed a working definition of cancer recurrence and contracted the Cancer Institute New South Wales and the Cancer Alliance Queensland to develop and test methodologies for the collection of recurrence data. These methodologies were tested in New South Wales and Queensland to estimate the rates of cancer recurrence, again for the top five cancers. Cancer Australia is currently seeking to perform further testing of these methodologies in additional jurisdictions. We applaud these efforts and want to see that the knowledge gained from these projects is built upon, but we know this will take time, commitment, and importantly, national leadership. In the absence of cancer registry data, biostatisticians and epidemiologists can use modeling to estimate how many people are living with metastatic breast cancer. And this was done in 2008 by researchers at the request of breast cancer consumer advocates and the National Breast and Ovarian Cancer Center. And this modeling indicated that in 2004, 8,284 people were living with metastatic breast cancer. This modeling, when applied to today's breast cancer population, indicates that there could be 10,553 people living with metastatic breast cancer in Australia in 2020. However, some of the assumptions used in this model are potentially outdated, and it is difficult to comment with certainty about the currency of the estimate. What is widely accepted, however, that an estimate generated using this model is likely to be conservative. This is because one of the key assumptions on which the model is built how long someone will survive after being di diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer is now out of date. We know that average survival after diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer has doubled in the US between 2000 and 2017. Recent modeling from the US that accounts for this improvement in survival has calculated that compared with 2005, by 2025, the number of women living with metastatic breast cancer in the US will have increased by 55%. If we apply the same percentage increase to our Australian data, it would suggest that by 2025, we will have 12,840 people living with metastatic breast cancer. And in the absence of cancer registry data and recurrence, um, cancer registry staging and recurrence data, another option is linking our existing health records with cancer registry data to identify people who have experienced recurrence. Dr. Sally Lord, one of the contributors to the issues paper, has done this. Sally's population-based health record linkage study 
combines data from the New South Wales Cancer Registry with broader health data, such as hospital admissions, radiation therapy data, and PBS data. Her work shows that it is possible to, routinely, to use routinely collected health records to identify distant recurrence and survival after recurrence. Sally's paper in the MJA provides us with the only population-based estimate of long-term breast cancer recurrence, i.e. beyond five years in Australia. She reports that in New South Wales, for women diagnosed with local or regional breast cancer in 2000 and 2001, that over the next 14 years, 22% will experience recurrence. She's also reported Australia's first population-based metastatic survival data after recurrence. Median breast cancer-specific survival was 28 months after recurrence, and five-year survival after recurrence is 29%. Sally and our team at the Daffodil Centre are currently using Sally's data set to estimate metastatic breast cancer prevalence in New South Wales, and we hope to report this data early next year. So although incredibly useful, modelling and health record, study, health record linkage studies need to be updated regularly, and currently no system is in place to allow this to happen. Sally's data provides us only a snapshot. To be really useful, we need to repeat this work at regular intervals so that we can understand the effect of newer therapies, for example, Herceptin, CDK inhibitors, and Tridel-V, and what the effect they are having on recurrence, metastatic survival, and the number of people living with metastatic breast cancer. I know that I'm not alone in having experienced gaps in supportive care. I hear this firsthand from the people I meet through my work as a consumer rep and through my work as a researcher. BCNA has also amassed considerable evidence that gaps exist across Australia. BCNA's 2017 survey of 10,318 members, of whom 527 had metastatic breast cancer, asked participants about their information and support needs in the past 12 months and the extent to which these needs had been met. What they found was that people with metastatic breast cancer reported higher supportive and information needs than people with DCIS or early breast cancer. But they also found that people with metastatic breast cancer were less likely to have had these needs met. When asked specifically about support from health professionals, including medical oncologists, GPs, and nurses, the standout difference was contact with a breast care nurse. While 70% of people with DCIS or early breast cancer reported they had as much contact with a breast care nurse as they needed, only 56% of people with metastatic breast cancer reported they had had enough contact. I started this presentation by telling you about gaps in supportive care I experienced when I was first diagnosed. Despite getting off to a shaky start, I know I am one of the lucky ones. Things have changed at my hospital. I now have access to a specialized metastatic breast care nurse. She was originally appointed to work one day a week, but this quickly increased as it became clear what the demand was for her services. Six years later, this is now a full-time role, providing much-needed support to over 100 people with metastatic breast cancer. I'd like to finish with a comment from Kim Parrish, a close friend and fellow member of the BCNA Metastatic Breast Cancer Lived Experience Group. This is one of the comments she made to BCNA after reading one of our early drafts of the issues paper. This week while in hospital, I was amazed by how many people with metastatic breast cancer have silenced their voice. They simply didn't talk about having metastatic breast cancer. I conjecture this was because speaking gives their fear reality. They felt they no longer mattered. They didn't know how to hold the conversation in a positive light. They didn't know how to explain. It just made me conclude that it is not just the lack of data that makes women disappear, but their own state of mind. I agree with Kim, it's not just about the data, but I'd ask what is it that is shaping their state of mind? Why do these women feel invisible, feel unable to talk about something that has changed the course of their lives forever, that will ultimately take their life? How have they been silenced? I know how deeply many of you feel about supporting, caring, and advocating for people with MB metastatic breast cancer. And I hope that together we can work to help Australians with metastatic breast cancer be more visible and to have a voice. Thank you.
As Andrea outlined, some amazing work is being done to provide interim solutions, but we know this is not enough. BCNA believes it is imperative that Australia acts now. The US and the UK have started to make progress in this area as a result of strong advocacy. Our commitment to addressing this issue doesn't stop here today. This is just the beginning. Our advocacy to work to support this group remains one of the highest priorities at BCNA. Our next step from launching this issues paper is to call for a national roundtable to bring together relevant stakeholders to help identify an agreed long-term approach and interim measures to reporting national stage and recurrence data and inform current policy commitments. We recognise often on a state or a jurisdictional level there can be great impetus and leadership where we are starting to make traction in this area. As a national network, we hope to draw on the collective experience and genuine commitment of those already achieving great things to help drive this national agenda. We hope those of you who work in clinical, supportive care, research and policy settings will register to be involved and continue to harness the momentum we have already generated so together we can create progress on the issues raised in this paper. We encourage you to engage with us on social media, share our post about the paper and respond with your own thoughts and stories about why it is important that we make metastatic breast cancer count. A copy of the issues paper is in your gift bag as well as a one-page summary if you don't have time to read it quite now. We all have someone in our lives who have impacted on us. These are some advocates who have come before us and who continue to inspire me to continue this work. And finally, thank you for everything you do and have done to make sure the lives of those impacted by metastatic breast cancer count. Thank you for making a difference to all those you have cared for, their families and their friends, those patients who you have really seen and taken the time to ensure they feel heard and don't feel invisible. And may we take a final moment to remember and reflect on those lives that have been lost, but have and will always continue to matter and make a difference. Thank you. And to finish off, I'd just like to acknowledge Dr Andrea Smith from the Daffodil Centre, Jodie Lardikas here today, who also contributed and supported the paper, Dr Sally Lord, Professor Di O'Connell, the BCNA Metastatic Breast Cancer Lived Experience Group, our consumer reps and the entire BCNA team who are all here today. Thanks again.